Tottenham who's boss? If one shot catches the appeal of Desperados 3, it's this. As you glide down a train mid-robbery, you drink in the beautiful miniature world, the little bandits bathed in the warm light of a Colorado dusk, bullets zinging with wispy smoke trails, and a future friend making a dramatic getaway. It's a taste of a massive level we'll be clearing out, actually very small by the game's standards, and also tells us exactly what kind of western we are starring in. It's big, bright and violent. Desperados 3 is the kind of western that doesn't get made anymore. This isn't Clint Eastwood in Unforgiven, wrestling with pigs and feeling guilty about his naughty cowboy days. I mean, there are farmyard animals in Desperados 3, but they can be mind controlled with a voodoo witch, which didn't happen in Unforgiven. Maybe the director's cut? The modern western is so obsessed with telling us what a total shit everyone was back in the day that they're not always a fun place to be. The Wild West, built by Mimi Me Games, is black and white and quite green if you factor in the giant view cones that tactical stealth games demand. Okay, they're down. It's basically Westworld before the robots went loopy, a series of magnificent sets for you to explore and admire before interrupting everyone's clockwork routines with a bullet. Thankfully, it's easier to fix than a haywire theme park. You just hit the quick load key and everyone is back for the bloodshed to start from scratch. You see, just as Desperados 3 is the kind of western that doesn't get made anymore, it's also the kind of game we don't see much of. Well, not until Me 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 came along and revitalised the genre in the outstanding Shadow Tactics. We're talking about real-time stealth tactics, sneaking a band of big characters through enemy territory using specialist skills and many cones of vision to avoid bloody and often doomed confrontations. You know, like Desperados 1 back in 2001. And I kinda love Desperados 3. This isn't a review, I've only played six levels from the game which launches on the 16th of June, but considering this is a preview build, I've actually played it more than I've played some Finnish games. I can't get enough of dragging tiny men into bushes, especially if I get their attention with a delightful cat first. So let's go over some of the reasons why. For starters, there's that whole brainwashing a chicken thing. Why cast black magics on a hen? Well, an obvious plus is that you get a big bird face in the bottom corner, which is superb. You can also use it to draw guards with a squawk so loud it causes the bird's body to explode. If you want to get really sinister, you can tether a chicken soul to a human's, think Dishonored 2's domino skill, and then ask sharpshooter Doc McCoy to put a bullet through its beak to kill the bonded guard. It's probably better to do this trick with two people, so not to waste a bullet, but I find chickens unnerving, so I'm generally on board. That you can dip into the dark arts is down to a new character to the series, Isabel Moreau. I've seen some people say that actual magic is too silly for Desperados. Maybe they forget that this is a series that used to let Doc McCoy attach gas grenades to balloons and float them over the enemy's heads before popping them. This is hardly the revenant when it comes to realism. And besides, brainwashing is limited by ammunition and Moreau's own limited range. You have to sneak her right into the lines den before she can have fun with the blowpipe. Crucially, I can't be cross at something that opens so many ingenious avenues. Tethering two guards in a group of three and hitting the third with a throwing knife as you shank two for the price of one, it clears out a formidable gang in total silence or using tethers with distractions. A noise one guard hears is heard by his soulmate, letting you reach ears with coins that otherwise wouldn't reach. Or you can go down the pure bastard route of linking a guard to an unconscious body and then chucking the sleeper in a river to drown his friend on land. To quote Paul Daniels, that's magic. Primed and ready. Who wants to have a look? That wasn't there. Here they come. 
Much of Desperado's 3's appeal lies in mashing up these character abilities. Doc McCoy's explosive bag draws curious guards over, and what better way to direct their attention towards it than with Cooper's coin? Or even better, placing the bag on Hector's bear trap and then drawing attention to it with a coin. See, where the bag's hidden gas would normally just stun the guard for a few seconds, this turns it into a deadly lure. Or even better still, doing it to a guard tethered to the guard watching him, so he feels the snap of a phantom bear trap at the exact moment he should be raising the alarm. It's very, very easy for ideas to cascade like this. So much of the game is about trying to lure people from safe places to bad places, or temporarily turning a safe place into a bad place, if only for the seconds needed to do a bad thing. Seeing powers collide to achieve that effect is a glorious thing, it's partly why the game places quick save and quick load so prominently on screen. Save scumming isn't frowned upon, but encouraged as part of experimentation and iteration. Seeing sloppy thoughts congeal into a rock solid master plan is so much fun. Of course, this is the appeal of the genre. Mimi Me Secret Source is showdown mode, which freezes time and lets you program a move for each character to perform on your save. As Cooper's daddy perfectly puts it in the tutorial, Think slow, act fast. They should really get him in the marketing department. It's a riff on Shadow Tactics Shadow Mode, only their time crept forward, meaning you still had to act relatively fast. It may seem perverse saying the best thing in a real-time tactics game is stopping time. If you feel that way, you can opt to keep the seconds ticking for a purist's experience. But the ability to store future actions on a keystroke opens up moves that I'm not fast enough to pull off in real time. Sniping someone at the microsecond they pass through another guard's blind spot, say, or prepping a coin toss to turn a sniper's head the moment you garrot their friend and chuck the body off a bridge. It's introduced more as a tool for simultaneous takedowns, and yeah, vanishing three guards at once is like commanding a squad of miniature Batmans. Batman? Batmans. Hmm, whatever. But the simple act of removing my ham-fisted hands from the thought process elevates this into something else. If you did play the original Desperados, where similar quick actions could be planned in advance, you'll love how much cleaner and smoother the process is here. Interestingly, Showdown also gives you a better chance when things do go wrong. Instead of reaching for the quick load key, it's fun to see if you can shoot your way out, stopping time to map Cooper's dual pistols to two heads and swinging Hector's cone of violence at a nearby group. Shooting your way out maybe feels a bit wrong after hours of methodical murders, but it's a smoother action experience than what came before. You even get set pieces where brash violence is encouraged. Gatling guns can be hijacked but make a big noise. Can you shoot those ears off before they hear you? And there's a cathartic ending to that slow train robbery where Doc and McCoy can choose to rain down dynamite on enemies below, like naughty schoolboys throwing stink bombs. All that aside, it's not as if guns have no role to play in stealth, you just need to be very careful. The game is very clear with audio awareness, showing how far a gunshot will reach and how much noise the body will make at the receiving end. Given that levels are so large, it's easy to clear out an area to set it up as Doc's sniper perch and fire without anyone hearing, as long as you can find the ammo crates to replenish his gun. It reminds me that the very first question I asked the team when I saw the game was how the notoriously loud guns of the West could still be fun in a sneaking game, and I really love the way they slot into the final stealth ecosystem. Next is Wild March. She's on the first floor of the Flagstone Brothel, drinking whiskey and watching the girls dance. I mentioned set pieces there. One thing that differentiates the Desperado series from other real-time tactics games is its eye for story. Every mission gives you freedom to play the purist's cat and mouse game, but a few suggest accidental kills that feel ripped out of Hitman. The town of Flagstone, for example, introduces civil zones where you can walk freely, only turning into a careful stealth game when you step into guarded buildings or areas. It's basically Agent 47 in a Stetson. 
civilians gossip about assassination opportunities in that hilarious way that only NPCs can. You heard what happened with the church bell the other day? Yeah. Just imagine if it fell down on Sunday with half the town standing underneath. And you are left to decide whether to investigate. Rather than feel like you're being funneled towards a solution, they feel more like spectacular punchlines for pulling off pro sneaking. After 30 minutes of surgically navigating this building site, it felt great to do a violent impression of Buster Keaton. The Hitman similarities only increase when you return to a mission a second time. On completion, you're given a set of secondary objectives. One is always a simple speedrun task, asking you to do a level in 10 minutes when it just took me two hours. But others ask for quirky kills, or not hiding any bushes, or never firing a gun. Tasks which completely change your approach to the game. Now you can begin to understand why a preview build is one of my most played games of 2020. It feels like there's going to be loads to savor and master here. Of course, everything I've mentioned would be meaningless if Desperados 3 didn't get the basics right, and it's here that Me 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 proved themselves masters of the genre. The game is so beautifully fair, giving you every bit of information you need to pull off your plans. From the view cones, their two levels of sight range, you are fine to be crouched in the shaded area, but a body there will be seen, to the various audio indicators showing the precise location a thrown penny can be heard, or circles showing the reach of each attack. It's an incredibly precise game. Compare it to Hitman, another of my stealth favourites, and you realise how much of that game is dependent on a rough feel for mechanics. Agent 47's coin work is far more imprecise. Interface may not be the sexiest thing to get excited about in a game, but here it really does let you deliver. Some of my favourite moments are where you basically walk through enemy territory because you've plotted a perfectly timed route through sweeping view cones, or this moment where I dragged a body in a straight line to keep it in the precise blind spot created by a tree stump. I know this may seem basic, a kind of real-time tactics 101, but it's thrilling to execute it so smoothly. You just know that people are going to post some absurdly good videos of high-level play. And thankfully, you won't have long to wait for that. Desperados 3 rides into town on the 16th of June. I adore what I've played of it so far, and struggle to imagine what the remaining missions would have to do wrong in order to sour that affection. Short of introducing a sixth playable character who has their foot trapped in a very loud bucket, this is well on its way to being one of my games of the year. If you enjoyed this little amble through the tiny Wild West, you could maybe check out my earlier videos where I go into more of the basics. And if you have any questions about what I've played, pop those in the comments. Oh, and tell me your favourite western while you're there, I've been watching loads of them during lockdown and would love to know if I'm missing any hidden gems. Anyway, I hope your lockdown is going okay and I hope to see you again soon. Bye for now. Let's find a safe spot to meet up.